exhibition. Our uh, final presentation today is by Dr. Grace uh, Young, an engineer by uh, X, former Google X, a subsidiary of Alphabet, whose mission is, and I quote, to invent and launch breakthrough technologies that could someday make the world a radically better place. Grace Young has studied mechanical and ocean engineering from MIT and completed her PhD at the University of Oxford. But she is also a former ballerina, a Navy sailor, a diver, uh, and last but not least, an artist, uh, living and working in the ocean. Dr. Grace, great to have you with us. Awesome, thank you for that wonderful introduction. When I was younger, I thought I would be a ballet dancer. And now I am an engineer who builds technology that operates under the ocean. My training as a dancer not only launched a better engineer, that always surprises people. Towards the theme of this conference, uh, humanity in the age of AI, I will share my journey from arts into engineering and AI. I'll explain how I see that connection through my own story. I tried to write out the connection using words, but I found a math formula was better. So here it says art implies or is proportional to science, which is a function of AI. Through high school, I was training to, as a pre-professional dancer, I was training 20 plus hours a week. And uniquely, the dance company I was with encouraged us to combine artistry with the topics of the day that interested us. Um, at the time, I was fascinated by carbon nanotubes, the structure you see here. I had read about them and talked to researchers about them. I did, um, then we did a dance piece about the carbon cycle where our hands and feet were covered in charcoal that then smeared across the stage as carbon footprints as the piece went on. I was fascinated by quantum physics too. So we created a piece on quantum entanglement using mirrors to show intangible connections between particles. I'm so thankful for this company and the community around me then for nourishing the combination of science and art. It gave me the confidence to do what I did next. My transition into robotics wasn't so graceful. It was actually quite awkward. Um, I guess ballet made it such that I was the last person someone might envision to get into robotics. Um, I know this because the robotics team was brand new to my school at the time, it was a trial. And the schoolmaster just told the few guys at the school who he thought might be interested. So I didn't hear about the robotics team until a few months after it was going. And I was the only girl for a while. I sort of clumsily walked into the lab out of sheer curiosity. Um, I, I felt behind at first because I joined a few months late, but looking back, thankfully I had the patience with myself to keep with it because soon I was enthralled with robotics and I was initiating new team members myself. The main photo here is my friend Kylie and I. Both of us are professional engineers today. We were enthralled with robotics. We got started right away trying to build a claw that would toss a ring through a hoop for the robotics competition. We connected pieces with bolts and screws and wire ties. In this sense, it was something very tangible. It felt like dance, it felt right. I had this feeling in my body that it, it felt right. Fast forward. When I was at university at MIT studying engineering, my first independent computer vision project was for an environment that I knew really well, the dance studio. I used the Microsoft Connect sensor to track 
a dancer's alignment during a pirouette turn. So on a pirouette turn, as you see here, the difference between landing eight spins versus one comes down to tiny changes in a dancer's alignment between her toe, her knee, her hips, and her head. The computer vision or AI program was a tool to pinpoint which elements of alignment you might have off. As the person spinning or even a teacher, it's really hard to tell what those are. Um, this led me then to working on other advanced camera systems for difficult environments. One of those difficult environments, my favorite actually, is underwater. Underwater, it's challenging to say the least, it's dark, it's cold, the pressure can be crushing, uh, GPS and Wi-Fi don't work underwater, but none of those kept me away. I had the chance to live underwater in the habitat you see here called Aquarius. I was living there as an aquanaut on a mission led by Fabian Cousteau, who's Jacques Cousteau's grandson. I was there because I adapted an ultra high speed camera to work in the underwater environment. So our eyes see at about 30 frames per second. The slow motion setting on an iPhone is 240 frames per second. This camera could film at up to 18,000 frames per second. And that let us see for the first time marine creatures that move faster than the human eye could see. It let us film them in their natural environment. So here's my fellow aquanaut Liz and I using the camera. The helmets we were diving in every day were really heavy, even underwater. And we were diving six to eight hours a day. So once in a while, which was fall to the seafloor. And then with a the neoprene, my legs would float up naturally. And I was doing this, taking a break, um, when I found myself staring at a bland patch of sand for about 30 seconds. And it took that long for me to realize that I was staring eye to eye with this very well camouflaged mantis shrimp. And this movement you see here that we captured with the camera, this happens faster than a bullet comes out of a gun. In real time, I had no idea that the mantis was even feeding. I just saw a blip of sand and, and really didn't know what happened. It wasn't until being able to see this video slowed down to a time scale that I could process that I noticed it was feeding. Um, and in this sense, we, we wouldn't have the power to see what was happening here without the aid of technology. We really need it. And even still, the mechanics of this creature astound us. On top of this, it has one of the most complex visual, si visual systems in the animal kingdom. It can see 16 different colors, whereas we have see only three. We have a lot to learn. Here's another example. From far away, I thought I saw footprints from a ghost walking along the seafloor. I'd see a blip of sand, and then a few feet past another blip of sand. Only getting to watch the footage slow down like this, did I see that it was this lizard fish coming out of its hiding places in the sand every so often. Com technology here let us see the problem differently. We did all of this work from a habitat called Aquarius that's bolted to the sea floor. It's only about the size of a yellow school bus and six of us aquanauts lived there. Rather than me explaining, I'm gonna use this video from Lego. Oh, hold on. Can people live under the sea? Yes, we can. And we can do amazing things while we do. I once lived under the sea for 15 days in a habitat on the sea floor. While I was there, I built a camera that can film some of the fastest animals in the water. And I've learned how to 3D scan coral reefs to help us protect them. There's a creative way to solve any problem. And sometimes it makes the world a better place. Visit lego.com with your family to find out more.
we were there to conduct scientific research, um, collecting sponge samples, um, measuring changes in plankton communities throughout the day, measuring contaminants in the water. But I also had the chance to dance. Um, it's hard to describe the feeling of dancing underwater. Uh, these, these emergency air supply cylinders are, that I'm standing on top of are about a story high. But underwater, I can scale them easily. The pressure of the water beneath you, below your body, beneath my leg, helps lift us up against gravity. Plus, with my breath, I can control my buoyancy or z-direction movements. Below, um, I remember feeling jealous of eagle rays that were circling nearby. Um, Fabian captured the moment here with eagle rays in the background. You see, they glide so beautifully like magic carpets together in the water. And it, it really brought a contrast to me there with my heavy diving helmet and a hose um, tethering me to the habitat with our breathing gas. Even underwater too, even dancing ballet with Swan Lake arms feeling, I felt in one sense like the stereotype for how graceful a human could be. But then to see the rays um, really outdo us there gave, gave me a special feeling. <coughs> so when people ask me, why do you care about the ocean? I've got two sides to the why. On the one side, I have this feeling in my body from having been in, on, or near the water. I've had the amazing opportunity to experience the ocean differently from most people. And that feeling I get from being near the water, remembering my experiences underwater, that feeling is what keeps me coming back. On the other hand, when people ask me, why do you care about the ocean? All of these statistics come to mind. I mean, look at our planet. Two thirds of it is ocean. It provides food for three billion people. It provides half of the oxygen that we breathe. So even if you've never seen the ocean, you are connected to it. It controls our climate. It differentiates our planet from the other rocks in space. I mean, what stronger rationale logic could I need to care? So I have these two reasons. It's really the feeling that I keep coming back to and then the statistics that, that make me stay. One reason we know so little about the ocean is because our human biology limits us. This photo shows all of the gear that I needed to spend just 10 minutes at 100 meters. 100 meters is way deeper than most recreational dives, but still it's only scratching the surface of the ocean. The average depth of the ocean is 3,600 meters. The deepest point is one Mount Everest plus seven Eiffel Towers. And more people have been to the moon than have been to the deepest point in the ocean. We need all of the tools in our toolkit to understand and explore this place, let alone address the existential problems that it faces. Right now, I am working on smart camera systems, not to track dancers, but to track fish. You can see here, there's chaos in the scene. This is inside a fish pen in Norway. AI helps us make sense of this chaos. We're able to track each pellet falling through the water, for example, and track each fish face to check whether or not the fish is eating, for example. I'm someone who clearly loves spending time in the water, but even if a human could have their head here watching the fish, who would have the patience to track this behavior every day, 24 seven? Even if we did have the patience, we miss things. We can't distinguish between the fish. We spend much of our baby years learning to distinguish between human faces. The salmon all look the same to us. We can't pick up tiny changes like changes in oxygen levels that the fish sense, but we don't. AI is a cornerstone of our technology. Um, 
it, we need it to see what's happening under the waves. Um, frankly, I'm surprised when AI is not part of any modern image processing system. It's the best way to process subtle patterns, often barely perceptible to the human eye, from millions of chaotic images on a daily routine basis. So why are we doing this? Well, overfishing is one of the biggest problems facing the ocean right now. We've wiped out 90% of the ocean top predators in the last 55 years. Fishermen are catching less and less fish, even with more effort. Um, some industrial fishing nets are three times the length of Manhattan. Within minutes, they can destroy huge swaths of wild habitat that will never recover in our lifetime. Yet over 3 billion people depend on seafood as their primary source of protein. We believe sustainable aquaculture is a necessary solution to support our planet's growing population. Our tools help farmers and communities make informed decisions about how to care for their fish and the surrounding environment. My team is housed at X, Alphabet's Moonshot Factory. Alphabet is the parent company of Google. For a long time, we were called Google X. Our broad goal is to create radical new technologies to solve some of the world's hardest problems. And this requires bringing together all kinds of different thinkers and disciplines. Um, a couple of the things you may have heard, at, heard of that have, have already come out of the factory are self-driving cars, delivery drones, and balloons that provide inter con, uh, internet conductivity to remote areas. We look for solutions that might take 10 years to create, but if they succeeded, would have a 10x positive impact on real world problems. My team's moonshot is to protect and restore ocean health while sustainably feeding humanity. There are still so many open problems facing our ocean and our planet. These problems are ripe to have more people working on them. One big problem um, is that communicating climate change is hard. Um, one degree Celsius warming just doesn't sound like that much. The temperature in this room has fluctuated more than that and I've hardly noticed. The work of these Finnish artists um, showing projected sea level rise across a town with light really hit the message home to me. Art can make science more approachable, make it come home. Another big problem that I see is ripe for addressing is how can we repurpose goods? Who would have thought a carpet company would be helping alleviate this problem? So in the one photo here, the blue carpet that I'm standing on with a friend, it, the carpet is made from recycled fishing nets, which make incredibly durable rugs. And thank goodness for this use, by some estimates, discarded fishing gear accounts for um, half of all ocean plastics. There's a company in England that is repurposing fire hoses into durable bags and wallets. And you might think, well, fire hoses, that's just one thing. Like, what difference can that really make? Well, for a decade now, they've been able to divert from landfill all of the fire hoses from London that would have otherwise been discarded. That's 200 tons of material. And people love the story. Um, small things can turn into big things, and art and engineering together can solve problems. We need the next generation to be on board too. I'm inspired when I talk to little kids. I spoke to this pre-kindergarten class for just a half hour, and then after their teacher sent me this photo of a play robot that they made. Um, it's got CDs for eyes. It picks up trash around the classroom. Um, I don't know if you can read, but on the back of the board, it says, we are super engineers, we are super explorers. It, it shows the fun and ingenuity you can have when your mind isn't constrained. 
I think it's important to talk to kids about saving our planet and working on creative solutions, combining art, curiosity, and engineering for problems and solutions that we don't know exist yet. We need all disciplines working on the big challenges facing our planet. Artists, technologists, policymakers, communicators, educators. To bring it back to the conference's theme, humanity in the age of AI, I, as someone who regularly uses AI, I see it as a tool that can help us build solutions. And we certainly need all of the tools in our toolkit to work on existential problems like climate change. I see AI as just one tool though, like ballet slippers, but not the dance. The future is going to be, isn't gonna be about one technology. It'll be a combination and all of our power and our power will come from combining disciplines and ways of thinking into building resilience.